Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your prophetic word. Thank you for telling us of the things to come. And Father, we see that the things to come are things, many of them are now happening. And so please, Lord, enlighten our hearts and minds. Speak, Lord, through your word as we study today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, turn to Zechariah chapter 5, and boy, have I got a sermon for you. Uh, or has the, the Lord has a message for you. Zechariah chapter 5 couldn't be any more up-to-date than, um, than your newspaper or your Google on your, your iPhone. And so Zechariah chapter 5, and we have lots of symbology here. Remember, Zechariah had eight visions in one night. Now imagine, that must have been a pretty rough night. Um, and we're actually looking at the, the sixth and the seventh. There's one vision to follow this. We'll get to that in our next sermon. But chapter 5 actually has two different sort of visions, but they're one. And so we're looking at Zechariah chapter 5, but first a little background to get us caught up. So this uh, is, the series is called um, Unfinished Business or a Finished Work on the book of Zechariah, and uh, God has still unfinished business to do in each of our lives, just like he had unfinished business to do in the temple. This particular sermon is the judgment hour message, or the last message of mercy. So God has a last message for his people today. We're going to look at that as we study God's word. A few keys for understanding before we get going. The sanctuary is an illustration of how God does what? saves people. And we see that as we walk through. We've seen that in the past. But there are many illustrations and imagery in the book of Zechariah regarding the sanctuary. We've seen several of them. We've seen a wall of fire, right? The fire that would, that would stand over God's people. We've seen glory within. The Shekinah glory was in a mostly place. So these are just some of the things we've seen. We've seen removal of sin in one day. Now, to, a, to the Jewish mind, to the Hebrew mind, they're thinking the Day of Atonement. And so that's also sanctuary uh, language there. We saw in chapter 3 that Joshua was the high what? Priest. And that's, again, all this relates to the sanctuary. Uh, we saw in chapter 4 that there were the this, this seven branch what? Candlestick, right? So we see the candlestick. That was in the holy place, and then uh, we will see the holy place today uh, mentioned in symbology. So again, you see here the sanctuary. We've looked at it before uh, as we've gone through this series. But again, you enter the sanctuary from the east. So the sanctuary can be seen as our experience growing with God. We come to God, we grow with God, we mature uh, there represented by the most holy place. There's many other lessons and many other ways you can look at the sanctuary, but that's just one. <clears throat> but as you come in the east, you come to the altar of burnt offering, and then the labor, and the altar of burnt offering, of course, they're the Lamb of God, as Lexi sang, sang about it. That's Jesus, and we accept him as our sacrifice. That's a very primary foundational thing to Christianity, to true Christianity. And then the bronze laver representing baptism. And then the holy place. We're going to look more at that here in a, little, in a little bit. But you can see the three things that were in there. What were the th three things that were in the holy place? Candlestick, right? Okay, that was one. The golden lampstand or candlestick. The light was burning all the time. The priests had the job of making sure that burned all the time. What else was in there? Table of showbread, right? So the bread, so the 12 loaves of bread. And Jesus, in John chapter 6, declares himself as the bread. What else? One more thing. The altar of incense. So this incense wafted up, and it wafted over into the most holy place. And we see in Revelation that incense went with the prayers of the saints. And so we see these things in the holy place. That will become more, uh, more interesting and pertinent as we get into our lesson. Now, it's really important that you understand the background for chapter 5. 
because these eight visions, really they go together. Uh, there's actually a, a chiastic structure here. We won't get into that in this particular sermon. But there's also, it, it also builds from chapter 1 all the way through. Um, however, chapter 3 is pivotal. It's crucial. If you don't under, chapter 3 is where the gospel is. And if you don't understand chapter 3, then you won't understand how to have the experience of chapter 4, and you'll end, end up with the experience of chapter 5. I hope that comes clear as I go through the sermon. But in chapter 3, there it tells us that God saves us completely. Remember, that chapter 3 is where Joshua, the high priest, was standing, and he had filthy garments. Now, these were, I mean, filthy is not even a, a strong enough term. Um, uh, these were bespotted by, um, what shall I say, bodily fluids were, were bespotted on these garments. And that's the way that each one of us are outside of Christ. Amen? Amen. We have no righteousness, nothing to offer God. But Christ was that high priest, and he took that filth, he took the curse of sin upon himself, that we might have the blessing. Amen? Christ did that for each one of us, for the whole human race. Our job then is to keep that, or to accept that, and to allow Christ to, to give him our choice every day, and allow him to work that out in the sanctification of our lives. So chapter 3 says that God will save us from sin's guilt, its power, and one day from its very presence. We'll be completely restored. Chapter 4 tells us how, or shows us the result. Because in chapter 4, you got these two olive trees. You guys remember that? Two olive trees, and they're going into this big lampstand, and it's just constantly producing light. You can constantly produce light. Amen? If you have the experience of chapter 3, if you understand the gospel and allow it to change you, you will have light. Let's move on. <clears throat> so chapter 3 is the everlasting gospel. We'll go back and look at it briefly because it demands our attention. Chapter 4 is a church filled with light or the Holy Spirit. And so let's go, let's take a, just a quick look back to chapter 3 because, like I say, it's so important. If you look at this as, as, a, as a chiasm or from 1 to 8 and then the, mi the, the middle, chiasm is just like sort of a gospel sandwich and, and, and what's in the middle is the most important. And so visions three, uh, 4 and 5 are the most important. And that's this one about the high priest and then the next one about the light. Those are right in the center. Those are the most important of these eight visions. But of those, I think three is, is even the most important. Chapter three, it's vision number four. But let's go back there. Chapter three of Zechariah, you should already be there. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist or accuse him. That's Satan's job. He does it in all of our lives. He accuses us, and he tells us that we can't be saved, that there's no way that God can save us and still be true to his law. Verse 2, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord, what? Rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? So you think of a stick in the fire, and it starts to burn, but it's pulled out of that fire. Jesus has pulled you out of the fiery pit of sin. Amen? The gospel is real today, and it's to be accepted by each one of us. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments. So Christ takes away our guilt, takes away our sin, and in its place puts righteousness. Amen? puts a love for him and his things. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And so God gives us freedom from the curse, which is disobedience. This will become very important as we look at chapter 5. Freedom from the curse of our unrighteousness. So he gives us freedom to have righteousness but it's also freedom from our righteousness. 
You're like, well, hold, well, no, no, I know I need to be freed from my unrighteousness, but from my righteousness? Well, notice the word our righteousness, right? Not his righteousness. Our righteousness, Isaiah 64, 6 says, is as what? Filthy rags. There's that bespotted garment again. So we need to be freed from that too, don't we? We need to be freed from our sin, but also from our righteousness, our righteousness. Yeah, that Christ might give us his righteousness. And so Christ says, oh yes, I can <clears throat> be true to my law and I can give these people salvation. I will be their substitute. I will stand in their place. By promise, it happened as soon as sin came into the world. And as soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. Jesus stood between the living and the dead and said, let the punishment fall on me. That's the Savior that we serve today. And so he became our substitute. Christ took the whole human race as if into himself. And he lived the perfect life. He died the death that we deserve. And he was resurrected for our sake. Amen? And so the gospel is crucial to this whole chapter 5. Now, chapter 4. So chapter 3 is the gospel. It's the everlasting gospel. Touching our hearts, changing us. And if we are changed, we will be light. Amen? We will have light in our lives. God's mighty working in you. Christ as Savior. Christ as Lord. The Holy Spirit filling your life and making you light. So, Again, just in anticipation of going to chapter 5, there is only how many ways? One way to deal with sin. Christ and God have the perfect solution. It's called the everlasting covenant because it was made by two everlasting parties before the foundation of the world. There is one way to deal with sin, and that is shown in chapter 3. God has to take off our filthy garments and clothe us with his righteousness. If you accept God's atonement for sin, then your experience will be the one in chapter 4. Amen? You'll, you'll be a person of light. You'll love the light and hate the darkness. If you do not, your experience will be the one in chapter 5. That's where we're heading next. So one gospel, but how many results? Two very different results, right? Because... It depends on how you relate to it. So some people will see Jesus' face when he comes, and they'll say, oh, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Oh, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. But what will others say when they see that face? Oh, no, exactly. <laughs> Hide us from the face. Well, the same face. Same face, but two different results, right? Two different reactions. The same is true with the gospel. If you accept it, it's a blessing. If not, not, well, we'll look at chapter 5. God's plan is complete restoration. Now, so far, we've been running through these different uh, visions that Zechariah's have, and they're all really good news. I'm, I, I'm in control. I'm in control of the flow of nations. I will, you know, I'll save the human race by my sacrifice. I will make you light one after another of these blessings. But now we see that there's more to the story because not only does God have to allow the righteous or allow humans, any human that will, be saved, he has to do away with sin completely. Amen? His goal is to never do away with any sinner, right? He loves the sinner, hates the sin, but sin eventually has to be done away with. Amen? And in order to do that, some things have to happen, which we'll see in chapter 5. This thing is bigger than us. You might be thinking of just how it relates to us, but it relates to the entire universe. A universe looks on. I love how Phillips paraphrases Romans 8.18. He says this, in my opinion, whatever we have to go through now is less than nothing compared with the magnificent future God has planned for us. The whole creation is on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of the sons of God coming into their own. Can't you just see that in your mind? You know, you're on, the whole universe is on tiptoe. What are they going to do next? Are they going to accept? I mean, God's done everything. What are they going to do? Well, that's how 
Phillips paraphrases that verse. Righteousness must reign in all who will. That's the sealing process that happens before Jesus comes. The sealing is God sealing us in our foreheads. What does that mean? Like a big stamp? No, it's not a stamp. It's his character, amen, as we allow it to transform us. Wickedness must also run its course, right? And be obliterated. And Psalms 37, 5 says the wicked's own sword enters into their own heart. Amen? It's not as if God so much comes down. It's sin taking its own course on the wicked. God will have a clean universe and happy people. Amen? How many of you will be looking forward for that kingdom? No more crying, no more tears, no more cancer, no more depression, no more suicide. All these things will be passed away. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness. There's that light that you get as you accept the gospel. Through the realms of illimitable space, from the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare what? What does it say? That God is love. That's the universe that is awaiting each one of us. If that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what, what will. Come on and say amen if that's good news. Now, before Jesus comes, there's a message, a message, a message to come out. Come out of Babylon. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being what? Withdrawn from the earth. Those four angels in Revelation 7, they're slowly withdrawing. And that's why we're seeing calamity after calamity happen. Plagues and judgments are already falling. Now, this isn't talking about the seven last plagues. That hasn't happened yet. But apparently there are pre-plagues that are falling right now upon the despisers of the grace of God, the calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war, we see that all over, are portentous. They're great. They forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. The, the agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. We're going to take a look at some of that today. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world. We're seeing this now. And the final movements will be what? Rapid ones. This is the day in which we live. They're ha happening so fast, you can't keep track of them. I can't keep track of them. The Spirit of God is being withdrawn. Disasters by sea and land follow one another in quick succession. Airplanes missing. How frequently we hear of earthquakes and tornadoes of destruction by fire, flood, with great loss of life and property. In them all, God's purpose may be read. Don't miss this. They are among, they are among the agencies by which he seeks to do what? To arouse men and women to a sense of their what? Of their danger. We're, on, we're living in dangerous times. Amen? spiritually, physically, every way you think about it. These are dangerous times. Now, good, we have a God that will keep us and hold us. That's all true. But we live in the midst of dangerous times. With all that said, let's go to verse 1 of chapter 5. There's only 11 verses here in chapter 5, but we're looking at Zechariah chapter 5. You should already be there. And it says from the King James Version this morning, Then I turned... And lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a what? A flying scroll or a flying roll. So there's this flying roll, roll. How big is it? What does it look like? We'll find that out. But one thing to note in verse 1 there, he turned. Now in all the other visions we've seen prior to this, he didn't have to turn. He never turned anywhere. I mean, he had to look up or the angel had to wake him because eight visions in one night, I think he was, it was a little much for him. But... In this case, he turns, and I see a turn in what's happening in these eight prophecies. There's a little bit of a turn that's happening here. So this flying scroll, Jeremiah tells us, is indeed the word of God. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, Baruch, 
wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him upon a roll or a scroll of a book. And of course, that's the way they had the Bible, right? It was on a roll or a scroll that, you know, that was un, <clears throat> um, unraveled or you know, as it went forth. Now look at verse 2. And he said unto me, what do you see? And I answered and said, I see a flying roll or a flying scroll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof, how much? 10 cubits. So this is 30 feet by 15 feet. Now this is a big old, I mean, I can, in my mind, I'm thinking of a little airplane pulling a banner behind it, right? You know, 30 feet by 15 feet. This is huge. Now they had lots of scrolls in the day that this was written. None of them were that large as far as the, both dimensions. Now, some of them were much longer, but they would only be about this wide, and they'd have, you know, text written on them. But this was a huge, huge scroll. Now, note something. This is very interesting. The size, 15 feet by 30, or 10 cubits by 20 cubits, is exactly the same size as, what does it say? The holy place of the sanctuary. Isn't that interesting? So he sees the holy place flying in the midst of heaven. I saw the everlasting gospel flying in mid-heaven. Interesting. What could this be telling us? Well, a candlestick was in the holy place. It gives light to all that are in the house, Matthew 5 tells us. So let your light shine before men that they may see your what? Good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the what? The law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to do what? To fulfill or to fill them up with meaning. So behind this candlestick is us doing good works. God working in us. It's about maturing in Christ. The bread. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And in fact... He will be satisfied. He shall never hunger or never thirst. So is your experience one where you're becoming more satisfied in God and his things? Not so much in your circumstances, but in God and his things. That's the whole question. That's what this flying scroll is asking. Revelation 8.3, talking about the golden censer. There was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So we see a flying scroll. The scroll represents the word of God, but specifically it represents the Ten Commandments. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, Then he said to me, This is the curse that goes forth over the face of the whole earth. And you're thinking, well, Pastor, why are you calling the Ten, Ten Commandments a curse? Keep with, stay with me. For everyone that steals shall be what? cut off according to one side, and everyone that swears falsely shall be cut off according to the other side. So we see the third commandment and the eighth commandment cited here. It's basically talking about the whole law. It's, a, it's, a, it's code for the whole law. He went from both tables of the law. And so everyone who steals or breaks the law is what? Cursed. So again, just like we talked about the gospel, it's a blessing to those who, who love it, Jesus' face, so is the gospel and, and the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is the greatest blessing to mankind, but if you choose to say, I, I don't care about the Ten Commandments, I don't want to keep the Ten Commandments, what happens in the judgment day to you? The Ten Commandments become a curse, <laughs> right? Because it's by the truth, it's by the Ten Commandments that we are judged. Now, now, salvation is by faith completely, right? But if that faith doesn't work, then it's not true faith, James says. So what is your faith doing? Are we obedient to God's Ten Commandments through faith? Because otherwise, the law becomes a curse to those who do not keep it. Actually, Galatians 3 says, Cursed is everyone who does not keep all the things written therein. So the curse is disobedience. The scroll is the Ten Commandments. Now it's interesting because here it talks about written on the one side and written on the other side. How were the Ten Commandments written? 
two stones, but they were written on both sides, right? On the one side and on the other side. That's what Exodus 32.15 tells us. So this is clearly talking about the Ten Commandments, not just the fact that it's written on one side and the other side, but also it, it quotes two of them, stealing and swearing falsely. Now look at what this curse does, verse 4. I will bring it forth. First of all, who is speaking here? God is. God says, I will bring it forth. So this isn't something the devil is doing. God is allowing this thing to come forth now, says the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and into those of the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name, and it shall do what? Remain. So it enters, and then it remains in the midst of the house, and shall consume it with the timber thereof <clears throat> and the stones thereof. And so the gospel goes forward, and this curse now, or this judgment, goes and enters the house. And you know, there are some that say, well, you know what, Ten Commandments, that may be good for you, religion is fine. As for me and my house, I'll do whatever I want to do. No, you won't. You're going to still be judged by that law, amen? Every single one. Every single one on the planet. Look at verse 5 now. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up thine eyes now and see what it is that goeth forth. So in this chapter, we have two things that are going forth. One is this flying what? Scroll, right? That's going forth. It's, it's the word of God. It's the Ten Commandments specifically. And it becomes a curse to those who disobey it or to disregard it. We've all disobeyed it, but <clears throat> it's a different thing to have disobeyed the law than to totally hate the law and say, well, I don't, even, I don't even want that thing as my standard. That's different from having disobeyed it, which we all have done. So the other thing that is seen in this vision now, we see in verses 5 and 6, the angel that talked with me, went forth, lifted up my eyes, and said, what do you see that goes forth? Remember the Ten Ten Commandments were going forth, now this goes forth. And I said, what is it? And he said, this is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. Now, an ephah was a measure, something that they measured, and it was the largest measure that the Jews had. It was about, I've heard different different measures, but about eight gallons. So it was a, like a basket type thing, really too small to hold a person in, in it, unless that person was shrunk down uh, or the basket was enlarged. But we'll see in verses seven and eight, that's exactly what this ephah has. It has somebody sitting inside of it. So first we see this flying scroll. Now we see this basket with a person inside of it. This is crazy. Look at it. Verse seven and eight. And behold, there was lifted up <clears throat> a talent of lead. So this thing had a lead lid on top of it. Of it. And this is a woman that sits in the midst of the ephah. Verse 8. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah. And he cast the weight of the lead upon the mouth of it. <clears throat> now, how many of you have ever gone into your refrigerator and you're looking in that Tupperware and you're not sure what's in there or how long it's been in there, but you open, open it up and you're like, uh, honey, uh, you, you need to check that orange Tupperware. <laughs> right, right? That thing's wickedness. Well, that's about what we're seeing here, right? He takes the lid off and put the lid on that thing. I don't think I want to look in there. But this is serious business. There's a woman sitting in this basket. Now, that's amazing. And it applies to our day. You can't miss this. We're almost done, so stay with me. <clears throat> and she's in this ephath, which is the full measure. It's as if God is saying, look, sin isn't happening by the court anymore. It's happening by the ephath, the largest measure possible, bigger than eight gallons. So this woman is sitting in a basket. Now, be thinking... Revelation, Daniel, woman. Woman represents in Bible prophecy what? A church. I have likened my, my people to a delicate and comely woman, the Bible tells us. And so we see this church that is the epitome of wickedness. And we must identify what we're talking about here. 
<clears throat> this is actually from Gill's commentary. These are not my words. This woman is a very lively emblem of the whore of Rome, sitting as a queen upon many waters, particularly the wicked one, the man of sin and the son of perdition, the Roman Antichrist. That's exactly what this is talking about. And apocalyptic beast, who though he is called by his title, his holiness... Let him who hears understand. Are you, are you guys with me? His true and proper name is what? Wickedness. He may call himself holiness, but his name should be what? Wickedness. And again, we're not talking about a person. We're talking about a system. These are not my words. This is Gill's commentary. But it's right on. I could have written it myself. In 2006, <clears throat> now I'm talking a little bit about some things that are happening in today's world with this Antichrist power and the way things are combining with spiritualism in our world today and apostate Protestantism. In 2006, a large, at a large gathering of Catholics and evangelicals, a number of leading evangelicals laid their hands on the cardinal in public prayer. Now, this happened to be the cardinal of Argentina. Do you know what he is now? He's our pope. Francis. It wasn't his name at the time because they take on a different name. That's what it says. This was so surprising that my good friend in Argentina sent me an article appearing in the Argentinian Catholic magazine. In it, a story reported, it is a story reported under a heading that called the Archbishop, Archbishop Apostate. Very interesting. Now here's another quote from the Pope which I thought was very interesting, because you know, the, the papacy claims to be the vicar of God, which means they claim to be the Holy Spirit. That's what the representative of God on earth. The Holy Spirit's the representative of God on earth, no man, amen? But they claim to be the paraclete, which is a Greek word <clears throat> for the Holy Spirit, creates all the differences in the church and seems like an apostate of Babel. That just struck me as wrong. <laughs> I understand what he's saying here, because he goes on to say, oh yes, on the other hand, the paraclete unifies all our differences. We're different, but he makes us together. It's us in harmony as one. That just struck me as a bit wrong. But check this out, because not only in this vision is there one wicked lady, which is a church, in a basket, there are two other ladies along with her. Let's look at verses 9 through 11. As we close... Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out what? Two women, and the wind was in their wings. So they were moving. The last movements will be rapid ones. For they had wings like the wings of a what? Stork. Clean bird or unclean bird? Unclean bird. Revelation 18 says she's, that God sees Babylon and it's filled with every hateful and unclean bird. I hope this is coming together for you, and I wish I had another hour to <laughs> preach it for you. But we see this wings like a stork, and they lifted up the ephah. So these two women are lifting up the one woman between heaven and earth. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Where are they taking her? Where are they taking her in this basket? Where are they going? Verse 11. And he said unto me to, to build it a house in the land of Shinar. Do you know where the land of Shinar is? Babylon. This is talking about Babylon. They're going to build her a house in the land of Babylon, and it shall be established and set there upon what? Her own base. Now, I don't have time to go into her own base, but I'll just say this. You can look at Isaiah 14. You can look at Ezekiel 28. The base of Babylon, the message to the king of Babylon in, in Isaiah 14 is, you're the one that wants to be lifted up, and you want to sit on the heights, and you want to do this, and you want to do that. It's pride. It's selfishness. It's a lack of appreciation for the things of God to the point where it turns into a hatred for the very things of God. That's the base upon which this thing sits.
So two women like storks. Revelation 17 says, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of what? Blasphemy. This is serious stuff today. A quote, the Protestants of the United States will be what? Foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of what? Spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with the Roman power. So what are the three things that we see here? We have the Protestants of the United States grasping whose hand? Spiritualism. And then grasping whose hand? The Pope, right? So this is the threefold union, and under this influence, this country, the United States, will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling the rights on the rights of conscience. Now, do we see inklings of that happening? Absolutely. Absolutely. We see these things taking place in our time. Our Constitution is in shreds. And we knew about it long before. Well, what about spiritualism and the papacy, uh, apostate Protestantism coming together? They're Tony Palmer. Anyone heard that name? He's an Anglican... Uh, bishop, but he was with, he was good buddies in Argentina with our, our current Pope. And in fact, uh, they were very good buddies. I'll read on here. The Catholic charismatic renewal is the hope of the church. This is Tony Palmer speaking, the Catholic charismatic renewal. He also said this, he said, Luther's protest is over. Is yours? In other words, we all did the same, same things. Let's just all join together. Well, I'm all for unity among Christians. Amen? However, it's got to be built on truth. Amen? And we are not speaking the same language. You can say, oh, no, no, I believe that salvation is by faith, through grace, to good works. But do you know what that means? to the Roman church? Do you really know what that means? Do you know what grace, where grace comes from? Through the sacraments. I'm sorry to be so pointed, but this is so clear, and I can't do otherwise. That's their grace. Oh, they say we're saved by, by grace. That comes through the sacraments, through the Mass, through the other things, through Mary. No, 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 no. That's not what Martin Luther was teaching. Yes, the protest is still on. In 2010, the Catech Catechism of the Catholic Church states, moved by the Holy Spirit and by charity, we can then merit for ourselves and for others the graces needed for our sanctification. No, 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 no. And now this was not the current Francis, but the past Pope said this, Your, you charismatics are the hope of what? The Catholic Church. Did you know that the Catholic Church sent Kenneth Copeland to Europe to try to revive the Catholic Church? Friends, things are coming together. They are already holding hands. Are we awake to what's happening around us? Spiritual manifestations. There's a channel wholly devoted to himself and under his control, and he can make the world believe what he will. The book that is to judge him, that is the Bible, and his followers, he puts it way back in the shade, just where he wants it. They attract the attention of the world to themselves and to their miracles and lying wonders which they declare far exceed the works of Christ. Thus the world is taken into the snare and lulled into a feeling of security not to find out their awful deception until what? Until the seven last plagues are poured out. I don't want anybody in this congregation or in this place of Fresno or anybody within my range to have that happen. i got to tell them. Satan laughs as he sees his plan succeed so well that the whole world is taken in the snare. When the last decision has been made, when all have taken their sides, either for Christ or the commandments, either for Christ and the commandments or the great apostate, God will arise in his power and the mouth of those who blasphemed against him will be stopped forever. And I say amen to that. Every opposing power will receive its punishment. 
And so all the world wondered after the beast as this powers, these conglomerates are joining together more than ever before. And so the question today for us is this, which will it be? Babylon or Jerusalem? That is New Jerusalem. Will it be truth or error? Will it be life eternal or death forever? Wickedness in a basket or light, holy, wholesome light, righteousness that comes from God? Will it be Christ or the Antichrist? Will it be the curse or the blessing? Christ, our Savior and Lord, sits as high priest, but someday soon, Daniel says that that high priest will stand, and there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there have been a nation. Now this would all scare me to death, because quite frankly, I deserve the curse, and so do you. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have stolen or swear falsely or done something to break some of the Ten Commandments. But this is where our hope lies. And we're closing with this. Although the law is a curse, and cursed are those who are disobedient to the law, someone bore that curse for us. Amen? Christ, our Savior, he bore the curse with the mighty argument of the cross. Christ silences the bold accuser. A.T. Jones wrote this, But thanks be to God, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. That's Galatians 5.1. All the weight of the curse came upon him. For the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. And whosoever receives him receives freedom from all sin and freedom from the curse because they are free from sin. So entirely did Christ bear all that curse that whereas when man sinned, the curse came upon the ground and brought forth thorns and thistles. The Lord Jesus, in redeeming all things from the curse, wore a crown of thorns, and so redeemed both man and the earth from the curse. Bless his name, the work is done. He has redeemed us from the curse. Thank the Lord, he was made a curse for us, because he did hang upon the tree. Let's pray. Father of ours, these visions are startling and their application is so close to our time. Lord, it's right here. And so, Lord, we feel that things are wrapping up quickly. And you said that the last movements would be rapid ones. And we're seeing that all around us. Father, soon that law will go forth. The four mighty angels will loose their hold and judgment will come upon this earth, Lord. And it will come upon us. And Lord, we're judged according to the Ten Commandments. And Lord, we've all broken them. And so we all stand uh, in the same situation as these people whose house the law did enter and it stayed there and it consumed everything, including the people that were therein. Father, our only hope is a great hope because Jesus became a curse for us. And we're so grateful for the sacrifice made on Calvary and that Christ died to free us from the guilt of sin and even its power in our lives today. Father, thank you that you've shown us the things that are happening just now as the threefold union is coming together. And we see wickedness is being raised up but at the same time, Father, you are raising up a righteous people who will uplift your holy law and show it to the world, not as something they must do, but as something that's already been done in creation and redemption for each of us. Bless us, Lord, <clears throat> as we look at what's happening in this world, and may our eyes be watching wide awake to the movements of the things that are happening around us. May we be accepting your gospel on a daily basis and allowing it to 
produce light in us before the darkness comes upon us. We thank you for being our God and for suffering the curse for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.